Hello, this is Jim Van Koski, curator of the Sports Legends of Delaware County Museum. Once again, Rich Bergano and myself are ready to talk about a, a tremendous athlete from Delaware County. Glad we have Rich with us. Rich probably is the best historian, sports historian that we have in Delaware County. I always like to say if I have Rich and uh, Harry Chaikin, you can have the other 550,000 people and we'll beat you in a Jeopardy contest. <laughs> So I'm, I'm complimenting you there, Rich. And today Thank we're you. going to talk about, well, if he's not the greatest professional athlete in the history of Delaware County, he, he's certainly up there. And arguably, he is the greatest professional athlete in the history of Delaware County. And in the year 2018, we erected, when I say we, I'm talking about the sports legends of Delaware County under the leadership of Phil Damiami, we erected a statue of Emlyn Tunnell. And prior to that, we found out there wasn't that many people that knew anything about Emlyn Tunnell. Matter of fact, we were lucky if they could pronounce his name correctly. And I'm still finding that out today, <laughs> that there are people that still don't know who he is and pronounce his name Tunnel instead of Tunnell. But Hopefully we're still spreading the word. We're still spreading the word. And as a matter of fact, with our good friends at Choice Marketing, we decided that in order to rectify that problem, we would produce a commemorative card set. The Life and Times of Emlyn Tunnell commemorative card set. Uh, and we're taking it in chronological order. We have 16 of these cards. We don't know how many of them we're going to complete today, but the ones we don't complete today will just follow through uh, next month. The first photograph happens to be titled Radnor High School All-Time Great. And you might say, where do we get that photograph? And it's so nice. Among uh, Rich's many collections, he has a yearbook collection. Uh, and this happens to, that photograph happens to come from the 1942 Radnor High School yearbook. What a joy they are. You're not going to find pictures like this anywhere else. No, that's for Unless sure. you go back. So we have that picture of uh, Emlyn Tunnell from the 1942 yearbook. So this would have been the 1941 football season. And rightfully so, they have him in a football uniform. Yeah. Uh, you can probably tell us why that might be the case in terms of his records that he, that he won. Well, yeah. I, it's interesting because um, he was brought up actually as a freshman, as a 13-year-old, Jules Prevost. In fact, the, the field is still named Prevost Field at, at Radnor because he was the coach. He also played football at Radnor and uh, was an outstanding player at Penn State. So he came back to coach at his alma mater, and he coached Emlyn Tunnell. And um, he brought Emlyn up to the varsity as, as a 13-year-old freshman, and he was a starting running back. I mean, he was just outstanding and um, uh, one of the best in the county. Uh, what I thought was interesting, um, I was able to interview a fellow named Elmer Shank, who may still be with us. This was a couple of years ago. And he had played for Ridley Park High School. And one of the best games Emlyn ha ever had um, was against Ridley Park because he had 250 all-purpose yards. He rushed for two touchdowns. He intercepted a, touch, uh, a pass and ran for a touchdown, which we call a pick six today. And Elmer Shank talk, talked to me about playing against him. And... Uh, I'm not sure if it was that year, but the one year in the locker room at Ridley Park, their coach, Doc Cornog, said, we're not going to win this game unless we get Emlyn to now out. <laughs> and we have a great picture of Emlyn, too, on crutches because in the second half, uh, someone from Ridley Park did hurt him, and uh, he didn't play for the rest of the game. Um, Ridley Park won that year, but the year that he had the 250 yards, all-purpose yards, uh, they did beat Ridley Park. But, you know, he was, he was a, a starter for four years. He was all Delco, all Scholastic, all Suburban, and all State. And not just in football, too. He was all State in basketball. And 
you always mention this too. We, we talk about various schools in our county that didn't have baseball teams. And Radnor didn't have a baseball team at that time. I can name other schools. Uh, our Mickey Vernon played at, at Eastone High School. They didn't have a baseball team. Um, but did you find out more about that? Did he, was he on the track team then at Radnor if there was no baseball? I don't, at, I'm not sure there was a track team because when we looked in the yearbook, the yearbooks would always say football, one, two, three, four, or baseball, yeah. two, three, four, or something like that. And I said, well, I don't understand why he didn't play baseball when they didn't have a baseball team. And he was a professional, we'll find this in a later card, he yeah. was a professional baseball player. But didn't he well. play for a town team? In, yeah, in, in, matter of fact, uh, we have newspaper articles of him playing at Lloyd Field in Chester. Yeah. Which, was, which is kind of interesting because we're going back into the 40s. And before Jackie Robinson integrated, really, they, you still had the local town teams, amateur teams that were integrated. Right. right. It was just the major league teams that were segregated, which is it's kind of an interesting aspect of American history that we're not here to talk about today. But I think that leads us off with a great card there. So we have Emlyn Sinnell, 1938 to 19, four years of, of Yeah, from 38 football. to 41. And yeah. that was really his... He was an outstanding all-around athlete, but I guess when you take mention the one sport, it's football that he really excelled in. And then the second card that Kevin will be putting up on the screen is also from the yearbook, and it happens to be Emlyn's graduation picture, which oh, is yes. really, really, really a, a great-looking picture from the yearbook. Uh, right now, we have a, a, an artist by the name of Craig Friedler. He's doing a portrait of Mickey Vernon. And the title of the portrait is, he's a cool looking dude. And when I look at this picture of Emily Tunnell, I think the same, same thing. thing. I say, yeah, Mickey cool Vernon was a cool looking dude and Emily Tunnell was a cool, cool looking, looking dude, dude as, as well. And when we were, uh, we got in touch with a lot of his teammates and Rosie Greer, one of his teammates said, he played hard and he partied hard. hard. You know, he was a <laughs> yeah. cool looking dude is what we're talking about here. So that photograph is, is kind of interesting, especially if it's still up on the screen. Take a close look at that suit, because I think there's a story in the book that we'll get to later that talks about that suit and how Emlyn Tunnell eventually ended up, and we're going to be looking at the third card now, Toledo University, running back, 1942. He accepted a scholarship. Yeah. And in the book, it talks about well, why'd you, why'd you pick Toledo University? And he said, they gave me a suit. <laughs> and, and I would not be surprised if that suit was the one that we saw on that previous card. Yeah. Emblem to now, making him look like a real cool looking dude. So Rich, this, this card, talk about yearbooks, took a lot of research, but this card, number three, Toledo University running back, 1942, uh, came from a yearbook. Yeah. It came from uh, Toledo University's yearbook, which is another reason why you, you want to save your yearbooks. Well, you I have think. to save those yearbooks. So I don't know if you have anything to add. Yeah, he, well, again, when he got to Toledo, he, he started as a freshman. You know, he, you think about freshmen sitting on the bench for a while, but, you know, he ended up starting in the, in, in the fifth game against Marshall College. He broke his neck. And uh, he was in bad shape. I mean, the one story talks about him being in a hospital and the, and the priest there giving him his last rites that he wasn't going to live. And uh, he came through it. And four months later, he's, play <laughs> he's playing on the uh, basketball team. And not just sitting on the bench, he's starting on the basketball team. And they had an outstanding season. And he lost two games. I think there were 22 and 2. And they beat uh, DePaul with big George Mikan, who was 6'11". And they beat LaSalle right here in Philadelphia Convention Hall. And they went on to play in the NIT, which at that time was a bigger national tournament than the NCAA tournament today. And they w made it all the way to the finals and played it. He play here he is. He had a broken <laughs> neck, but he's playing basketball in Madison Square Garden against St. John's in the finals of the NIT. Uh, you know, it's an amazing story. And that, uh, would, have been, that would have been 1943. 
because the football season was 1942 right. at Toledo. So then when they finally got to the NIT tournament, that, that would have been 1943. Yeah. And I'm mentioning that because in the next card, it'll, it'll, it'll give us an idea of, of what's going on here with his life. And I don't know if it's in the book or not. I can't remember. But he actually enlisted in the yeah. service. Yeah. And card number four shows a picture of Emlyn Tunnell crossing the equator. But we, before we talk about that in more detail, he tried to get in. And I don't know if you can fill us in. He tried to get into the Army. They wouldn't accept him because of his broken back or broken neck. Yeah, right. And he tried to get into the Navy and they wouldn't accept him for the same reason. Right. But somehow the Coast Guard, Coast Guard must have had a little, <laughs> their uh, rules and regulations must have been a little more generous at that point in time. But he tried to get in the Coast Guard and he was uh, successful. Yes. Yeah. And, and, and you have to remember that a, a lot of guys at that time did enlist, even, even right out of high school too. Uh, your old baseball coach from Chester High, Jess Brewster, told me when he was coaching football at Chester High, he lost half his football team because they all enlisted in the service and they were, they were in high school. They were high school students. So, Patriotism uh, was alive and well at that time. I think without, I, I, I know all those great baseball, like Hank Greenberg, Bob Feller. Yeah. They enlisted. They all enlisted, yeah. Now, Mickey Vernon, he got drafted. Some people got drafted, <laughs> some people didn't enlist. You know? I think I would have been the one that would have been the one got drafted rather than being enlisted. Yeah, enlisted. But, but the fact is, he was a patriotic American citizen. Without a doubt, yeah. And going, because you, 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 when you enlist, you know what you're getting into. Yeah, yeah. And uh, we have a lot of, to be thankful for that those greatest generation people did. Now look at that picture from card number four. It's Emlyn Tunnell. The title is Crossing the Equator. Now, believe it or not, there's only four cards that we have, when I say we, I'm talking about the United States of America, of Emblem serving in the Coast Guard. You know, we don't even have a picture of him in his Coast Guard attire. Uh, yeah. Again, we say this all the time. If we're wrong, prove us wrong, because we're, we're, I'm bringing this out. I would love to have a picture in our museum of Emlyn Tunnell in his Coast Guard attire. That's not available. This is a, an action shot. This is, a, uh, this is one of my this favorite is, That's pictures. without a doubt my favorite, yeah. Okay, it's, how about that? We didn't talk about that, no, but it's no. my favorite <laughs> picture in this card set. And there's Emlyn Tunnell. And this was a ritual. Yeah, it was an, I was reading about it. It's an initiation um, crossing the equator. If, if you've never crossed the equator, you were, they called them polywogs? Yes. Once you did this initiation, it was called the line crossing uh, ceremony, uh, which kind of helped you. I guess they talked about it in handling the rough seas. Uh, once you crossed the equator, then you became a shellback. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you were no longer a polywog, and uh, they called them the sons of Neptune, that whole idea of crossing the equator. And that's what they're doing. He, he, do they throw you backwards into the water and, and um, well, what? you know, I've talked to people yeah. about this and it, it gets to be kind of a, it's an ordeal. You know, it's not a pleasant ordeal. I don't know whether they still do it now. We'd have to talk to somebody in the Navy because I think the Navy had the same rite of passage, same ritual right. as the Coast Guard. Uh, so I don't know whether they do that or not today or if they substitute that because they, they say physical hardships and embarrassing ordeals in keeping with the spirit of initiation are tolerated. It was tolerated at that time. Whether it's tolerated at this point in time, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, but if you really want to have some fun, you should uh, Google that initiation, right? Crossing the equator. Crossing the equator. And this is Emlyn Tunnell, you know, undergoing that initiation. I just think it's a, it's a fantastic photograph. And I, who, who took the picture? I don't know. <laughs> you know who took it? And no. did, they, did they know about him? You got to remember, this is prior to him being an all-NFL athlete. Oh, yeah. So they didn't know anything about him. So here's a football hero. We're going to zero in on him. He was just a regular guy doing the same thing that everybody else did. It wasn't an initiation that, that everybody had to do it. Crossing the equator. 
Okay. Well, when we do the movie someday, we'll have to get somebody that's you know, willing, willing to do that. <laughs> I'm glad you said that, because right now with this pandemic, everybody's watching um, Netflix. And I'm thinking, what a, what a great series this would be. Uh, this would be, you know, this would be, uh, what do they call it, uh, session number four or something yeah. on Netflix. What do they call it? Um, An episode? Uh, episode. Or, I'm yeah. thinking the word episode. And I asked my wife about that this morning. What are they calling it? She said, episode. I said, okay. This will be an episode Without dealing with Emlyn Sinel crossing the equator. This is a movie waiting to happen. It sure is. There was a movie called uh, Hidden Figures a few years ago about the women mathematicians right. with the space. Um, Working at NASA for yep. a... That, this reminds me of a, a hidden figure. He's just a hidden figure, and it would be a great movie. Yeah. And I think that would somebody Hopefully should... Hopefully it will uh, happen someday. Somebody yeah. should be uh, thinking about that. And this is a, a, a chrono chronological series that they could follow. Sure. So we're, we're helping them out. And which, by the way, we have this on our website. We have these cards, and the back of each photograph, it tells you a little bit about the history of that card. So we got Emblem to Nell, Dot org. Easy, very easy website to remember, especially dedicated for Emlyn Tunnell. So you got www.emlyntunnell.org and you can look at these photographs at your leisure and read what the backs say and uh, do some research. I think you'd be very happy in, in, in doing that. All right, our next picture takes us to uh, silver life saving medals. And again, we're trying to be chronological. And when Emlyn was done crossing the equator, he was uh, decorated. Well, the decoration issued by the U.S. Coast Guard was in 1874. And when he was on the ship in the Pacific, I think it's off the coast of, of New Guinea, the Entenmann. Yes. The ship was, was uh, torpedoed by the Japanese, World War II. Right. And you might know a little bit more about this story than, than I do. Uh, would you like to well, talk about Well, I know that silver life-saving medal. It, Which we have right here, by yes, the way. Yes, we do have here, if you can. But be careful, because that'll fall down. Yeah. Um, but, but um, and you, you only get this if you've, been, you've been endangered your own life to save somebody else's life. So this, uh, this fellow that he saved after the, the hit from the torpedo, uh, he was burning. And... Uh, and Montanel grabbed him and helped, you know, put the flames out and, and, and saved his life. And, um, and it just didn't happen once with him. There was another fellow that, that ended up overboard and he jumped in the water. The story, I, I think he talked about in his autobiography, he, he didn't even know how to swim. And, uh, <laughs> He's in the Coast Guard. And, yeah, and he saved this guy. And uh, uh, so he... You talk about a World War II hero. He, he saved two people and uh, won that silver life-saving medal because of that on board. And the, the person he saved, now this happened in 1944. Think about that date. 1944, uh, the Japanese torpedoed the, the U.S. Entenmann. Emlyn Tunnell notices one of his shipmates on fire, completely on fire. Right. Runs to his service. Throws him on the ground, I guess. I'm trying. We'll have to see what the director would do with this in the movie. And you, with his body, he because he he got burns himself. You know, he was burned himself, and he and he and he puts him out. So that that was in 1944, sure. and then in 19, his name was well, his name was uh, uh, Fred Shaver. Yes, and we found out he was still living, up to a few years ago. He just died uh, like two or three years ago. Yeah, um, but keep in mind. How many people, if you and I were there and somebody was, <laughs> will we be running away from him or <laughs> running towards him to help him? Yeah, yeah. it's almost it's, uh, like the 9-11 situation where you had some people running towards the problem right. and other people were running <laughs> away from the problem. Uh, and he was one of the ones that ran towards the problem. And then the Al Gibbons was the person's name who he saved. Who, uh, and that was 1946. In the water. Uh, yes. Yeah. So, and the medal, this medal, we have this medal on display. And the, the medal came from uh, Dave Lyons. And Dave Lyons is on loan from Dave Lyons 
whose father actually was was a, somewhat of a classmate of Emily Tanaka. Right, they both go to Radnor. Yeah, yeah, went to Radnor High School, and he thought that it would be much better to have this medal at the museum so people could see it than him taking. He lives in California. Than yeah. him taking it home in California. So we were very grateful for uh, Dave yeah, Lyons to. Um, Great provided. donation for our yes. museum. So we have it on display, and we'll be talking about that a little bit later on as well. All right, so here we are, 1946, going with our chronological order. Did you have anything else to add on? No, to no. He, uh, yeah, he gets discharged from the service and ends up at the University of Iowa. Uh, well, they didn't call it the Big Ten then. It was the Big Nine because they didn't have ten schools yet. But... Um, he, uh, again, becomes a starting running back. He starts wherever he is, and, and he played at Iowa for two years. But the one uh, game that always, and I had written about uh, quite a bit, they played Notre Dame. And uh, all the talk was, you know, you're playing Notre Dame, and obviously they're one of the best football programs in the country. And he had his best game against Notre Dame. And they had Johnny Lujak on their team, who ended up winning the Heisman Trophy. And, um, wow, I did not realize that. Yeah, and um, Emlyn had a great game. I think he ran back a, a kickoff or a punt for a touchdown. And, in fact, the, the uh, articles in the paper, the reports of, from the game, talked about him being the star of the game when Iowa played Notre Dame. Yeah, the back of the card says, a guy named Tennell stole the show so, from Johnny Lujak. Right. So... He, <laughs> I mean, he was a running back. He was a quarterback. quarterback. He was a defensive back, a punt returner, kick returner. I mean, he's a, he's a, a triple threat plus Everything. two type of guy. But uh, he wore number 12 there. You can see in the picture. Uh, he did not always wear number 45. So in high school, you saw him wearing 44. Right. Now here he is wearing number 12. And you know what I noticed here? I just noticed this. Take a look at the picture. Take a look at the helmet. Seems as though he's wearing a leather helmet. Oh, yeah, yeah. And that's one of our uh, props here. Yes. This, uh, my little collection of leather helmets that I have at home. Um, that's a kid's one there. But, um, yeah, very similar helmet. Uh, what I thought was interesting, too, he talked about when he got to Iowa, over three, about 350 people were trying out because a lot of guys were coming out of the service and trying out for football teams and um, going to college and uh, he what did he say he said 60 of them maybe 58 of them were African Americans and that really that was one of the reasons he went to Iowa he had heard from someone that African Americans would get a fair tryout you know where at some other schools I, they, I they think need, one of his commanding officers I believe I read this uh, was an Iowa graduate, and I think he talked, talked, him, talked him into uh, going to the University of Iowa. Because there were some colleges in the country that didn't even have any African Americans on the team. So, another great story. Yeah. Another great story. Uh, now we have, we like to try to connect the generations. Oh, yeah, card seven there. Yeah, yeah. yeah card, so card seven is connecting the generations. We had a card coloring contest. And the winner of this card coloring contest was uh, uh, Drexel Newman Academy in Chester. We had over 450 entries, by the way. And we had a bunch of artists that would judge. So we thought this was a pretty good idea because once again, yeah, we're, we're going back to 1946, 1947. This picture was, was taken by Dan Fallone of Choice Marketing uh, from his rookie year. This is spring training. I call it spring training, fall training. What do they, what do they call it in football? Training camp, I training guess. Training camp, yeah. This yeah. was training camp um, in New Jersey where they were training. And he, he drew an outline, and we gave it to the 450. Different, whoever wanted it. We're going to do another one. We're going to do another one. when uh, That person that won, what did, what did we give them? I'm forgetting. Well, they got... Did they win something? They, yeah, they, we had a first, second, third place. They actually got deluxe bo two deluxe box seat tickets at a Philadelphia Phillies game, because the winner was announced in the okay, summer. Okay. So that was, uh, that was something that we want to continue to do, connect the generation, as well as preserving history, as well as rewarding excellence. Now the next picture, 
going back to baseball. This is Cedar Rapids, 1949. Yeah. This comes from a picture that was the Cedar Rapids Register, Iowa News Service. And he actually, we came up with the, that actually he was the first African-American to play minor league ball in the state of Iowa. Yes. And this is pretty early. I mean, yeah. this is. Well, well we're, we're talking before Jackie Robinson. No, uh, Jackie Robinson was 1947. 47. So this is right after Jackie Robinson. Okay. Before right. he, before he started with the, um, with the Giants. The second and, year in the Giants. Okay. So what he did was 1948, he played in the NFL. So now he's off until camp. And then he ended up playing professional baseball with Cedar Rapids. Uh, and then he stopped playing because he had to go to camp yeah. in 1949 with the New York football giants. So it's, uh, it's quite, Be, quite a history. Being the baseball person that you are, uh, Jimmy, do you think he could have made it to the majors? Or was he... I know he was an outstanding football player. Well, we I, know how hard it is to make it to the majors. Yeah. But it seems from all indications he could have. Because this lefty... Going back to Lloyd Field... You know, he was heavily recruited to play for the Delaware County team when they were playing uh, a bunch of professional teams. So it, he had professional qualities to him. He was an outfielder? Yes. So he was, um, it's a great picture, and it's, it's, a, it's a very historical picture as far as, far as I'm concerned. And um, he, they said he is believed to be the first African-American to play minor league baseball in Iowa. And again... We have 16 cards. We just finished card number eight. So we're halfway there. Halfway there. So hopefully you enjoyed what we've done so far. And hopefully you'll be able to uh, come back next month. We'll be back to do the second half. We'll do the... cards number nine, nine through... through 16. And we have a lot more enjoyable stories to tell you about. Emma Tunnell, arguably the greatest professional athlete in the history of Delaware County. And that's, and that's saying something. It sure is, because we, we have quite a list. We have quite a list. But nobody really has the story that, that, that he has in terms of the blending of the military and the athletics, <clears throat> and, and three different sports as well. And we might have forgot to mention, this is the autobiography, Footsteps of a Giant, of course, the medal and the helmet. And here is the miniature of our statue that's sits right outside of the municipal building there in Rounder Township. And, uh, so, and we'll be talking about those next month. Okay. So, again, if you're interested in reading a little bit about Emblem Tunnel, go to our website, emblemtunnel.org, and you'll find out a lot of information. And my name is Jim Van Kosky with Rich Pagano, uh, phone number is 610-909-4919. If you have anything to add to what we've been t doing, please give us a call. And for now, we're signing out. Mainline TV. It's a great opportunity to be here, and hopefully we can continue. This is about our 16th one.